Okay, um, here we go. Uh, so welcome everybody to Favro's uh, Agile Leadership Webinar Series. This is the Remote Game Studio Webinar. And we're joined today uh, by our special guest, Sam Alai, who's uh, an entrepreneur in the video game industry. And he is also an investor. Uh, he apparently, from reading your bio, this is the first time I'm meeting you, so it's very good to meet you. Uh, you started Remedy Entertainment back when you were just 21 years old. So quite an impressive accomplishment right there, above and beyond everything else Thank you've you. done since then. Uh, so welcome. And we're also joined today by Favreau's co-founder and CEO, Patrick Palm. And me, I'm John Leslie. I'm an Agile coach at Broad Cove Insights, uh, formerly worked uh, with Favreau directly. So again, welcome to everybody who's joining online and anybody who's watching the recorded version of this, also welcome. So we're gonna get started and I'm gonna share my screen. And we are presenting today as usual, which has become the new norm because I, I'm actually doing all my presentations out of Favreau now, not just this webinar, because it's proven to be so effective. We are presenting out of Favreau. So this is again, the Remote Game Studio webinar. And here we are in a Favreau, what's called a collection for those of you not familiar with Favreau. I'm gonna be sharing out a public version of this collection after the webinar. So anything that you see here today, you're gonna to be able to access directly. And also just to call it out, all of these cards as they are in Favreau, whether in timeline view, Kanban view, or sheets view, they're all clickable. And there's gonna be information, links, articles, attachments, all relevant to what we're talking about today. So valuable resource I'm gonna be sharing out with you after the webinar to all the registered attendees. Um, here is a timeline view we're using for an agenda. We're gonna first you know, introduce ourselves. Um, Patrick's gonna take us through the vision and the origin story of Favreau essentially. Uh, then he's going to conduct an interview with our special guest today. Then we'll dive into the kind of the meat of the presentation, what we're all here today to talk specifically about, the challenges, the benefits, um, just all about this move to remote and how game studios have successfully, a lot of the game studios that use Favreau has have successfully made that move to remote work. Then we're gonna quickly talk about a partnership between Favreau and my company, Barcove Insights, that we put together just to get game studios quickly up and running on the tool. Then we'll open it up to Q&A. So with that said, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Patrick Palm, again, CEO and co-founder of Favreau. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, thanks, John. And um, you know, I'll I'll, I'll keep it uh, brief. Um, you know, telling you know how we how we got into this. Um, uh, the story actually starts with another company uh, called Handsoft that I co-founded uh, with two other guys, and uh, uh, that was a, well, it's a tool for um, uh, agile uh, product planning uh, in in very large uh, software uh, companies, and. Um, we, um, we scaled that nicely um, and we sold it uh, to an American company back in 2017, uh, you know, very much to, to focus 100% on, on the vision of, of, of Favreau, uh, which we initially launched in 2016. So we, we were a little bit in parallel there for a while. And uh, what we learned over all the years, um, being in the agile community and working with game developers and, and, and other industries um, was that this agile way of working was really crossing over into into other kinds of teams, not just software development. So you know, marketing, um, you know, operations, you know, sales, executive manage, management, you know, basically everyone. Uh, so we thought if, if we would design a, a tool from scratch um, that would be very intuitive for, for any kind of team, you know, not just software developers, you know, what would that look like? And this was the first idea behind, behind Favro. Uh, the other idea uh, is that when companies are trying to uh, to be agile at, at large scale, um, there's very various frameworks you can use. But what we notice is that uh, companies are naturally organic, so many of these you know very process-heavy frameworks they don't really work that well. Um, after a while, things start to dissolve, um, and and more uh, what I call organic approaches 
um, to how to do this. Like for example, what's called the Spotify model and similar things uh, simply work better. Um, and um, so the second idea was, okay, well, how do we design something uh, that helps uh, not only with the team autonomy, uh, but also with alignment for the whole company, but not in the old fashioned kind of come on and control um, centralized processes kind of way, uh, but in a, in a modern, in a more agile way that builds on on, uh, on agility across the organization. So that was the second idea. And, and uh, the third idea is quite simple. It's just that um, the world has gone cloud, um, but we start to see that uh, companies start to demand a more, um, uh, more of an enterprise grade level of uh, security and, and, and you know, data governance uh, you know, compliance. And since you know, we've been working for a very long time with, with uh, you know, game developers and you know, defense campuses, et cetera, we, you know, we had a pretty good idea uh, what that would look like. And this is basically you know, the, the background to, uh, to uh, Favro. And um, we've been growing you know, nicely since, since 2016. And, and uh, uh, we have customers across you know, many industries, not just game developers. Um, <coughs> excuse me. It's both uh, you know, startups and, and, and unicorns and, and big enterprises in various industries. And, um, um, but I think what unites them all is that they are definitely more on the progressive or, or you know, the quite innovation um, uh, focused uh, in one way or the other. And there's a lot of really cool people uh, working at these companies, and uh, <coughs> one of them is um, family. But but we actually met uh, way before that. Uh, you know, we, we're both you know from Nordics. You know, we've been in the, you know in the industry for for a long time. Uh, so we kind of bumped into each other in you know various ways. You know, all, over the years. Um, and and now um, we, I I also have a small investment company where I uh, uh, invest very early stage in in, in among other things, games and, and games tech, uh, we have also, you know, now crossed paths in, in that way. So we have, we have quite a lot of collaboration points now, both uh, partners in investments, um, um, uh, customer um, relationship, you know, so forth. So I yeah. thought, of course, um, we should, we should uh, have you as part of, um, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, this webinar, because the only, the special guests we invite, you know, they have to be uh, our clients. And, and you know your 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 latest um, uh, company uh, is a favor client, so okay, qualified. Yes, now we can go. Um, so uh, with with that said, uh, you know I, I think you know John mentioned you know the background here with with you know, remedy, um, and and we have mentioned a little bit on you know investing to, today, but but you know there's, there's a whole journey there, and and it would be great if you could kind of just kind of take us through. Um, you know how you got started in the game industry and 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 you know the, the the path that brought you here. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. So yeah, I mean, uh, my start in the game industry basically began when I was uh, a, a young gamer on the Commodore 64, and I grew up playing games. And also then I migrated over to the demo scene, and the demo scene is actually the place where uh, the game industry sort of sprouted from or sort of uh, was bursted from both in Sweden and, and Finland and other countries as well. And back when I started 25 years ago in the game industry, there was only one game studio in Finland and that's Housemark and they still exist. So uh, I ended up uh, founding the second game studio in Finland that was, was Remedy with a bunch of, bunch of my demo scene friends. And, uh, and and since then, I have actually uh, gotten a little nuts with founding game studios. I'm, I'm now uh, setting up my seventh game studio. And uh, so I, I guess I'm an entrepreneur in, in, in my DNA very deeply. And I'm actually the fourth generation entrepreneur in our, in our family as well. So it kind of comes, comes in the you know, mother's milk as well. And, and what gets me most excited, excited about the games industry is, of course, the games themselves, but, but sort of working with really cool people on cool pioneering ideas and, and bringing some new kinds of experiences to people which haven't been seen before. So that really excites me, and especially the sort of founding phase when I'm, I'm look, uh, looking for the co-founders and then eventually starting to talk with the angel investors and then pitching bigger investors later on. 
all that gets my sort of juices flowing a lot. But then over the years, at some point, I was presented with an opportunity to also become an investor. And having done uh, or sort of sat on the other side of the table for so many years and so many times doing the same thing, I was like, okay, that would be actually an interesting challenge to also sit on the other side of the table at the same time. And so for the past six years, we've been running Sisu Game Ventures, where I'm a founding partner. And currently we have 51 portfolio companies and I have, I've had some, some very nice successes there as well. And we'll be continuing with that. So this puts me in a kind of a unique uh, sort of uh, position or category. So I'm an entrepreneur and an investor both at the same time, which gives me a unique angle or actually both of those angles into everything that I'm doing or, you know, supporting through CISO or, you know, so it's, it's a, a super exciting, you know, position to be in. And, and, and a lot of work, I guess. <laughs> oh yes. It feels like I have at least 50 jobs at the same mm -hmm. time. And, uh, you know, when you look at this from, uh, from an investor point of view, I mean, what, what are the, the the trends right now in the uh, in the game industry that you you find you know particularly exciting? Uh, you know, from from an investor point of view. Well, there's of course a lot of trends in the game industry always, uh, and uh, some of the big ones, of course, are free to play mobile games, which have been of course existing for more than ten years or roughly ten years now with the free to play model which is a proven market with industry leading scalability. As you know, most of the, um, about half of the game industry is already uh, free to play mobile games and it's just growing all the time bigger than any other sector of the game industry. For a while we were very excited about VR games, but everybody knows where they are currently. And of course, all of these multiplayer uh, social, social kinds of virtual worlds are always very interesting and user-generated content and these kinds of activities, especially when they're combined together. But what really always excites me the most is these sort of industry mega trends. So basically things which uh, remove obstacles and make things more accessible to a super large crowd of people. I mean, like uh, hundreds of millions of people, if not billions. So when the mobile phone was or the sort of modern age smartphone was introduced a bit more than 10 years ago, that changed things a lot. Basically everybody then had a, had a chance to have a game console in their pocket. And so gaming became mass market, mainstream thing over the years. And then uh, when free to play was introduced that, that basically lowered the threshold or removed the final obstacle. So everybody was able to play all games and nowadays everybody basically has, has a smartphone. So, you know, you could say that gaming is, is finally like a worldwide thing. And by some estimates, there's about two and a half or three billion people on this planet already playing games. And most of those people are playing on their phones. Uh, the sort of PC and console sector only, only is actually less than 10% of the whole industry in terms of amount of players. But the big one uh, that I'm most interested in right now is cloud gaming. Because again, it's something that removes ob obstacles and makes games even more accessible than ever before. So I'm predicting that within the next five years, uh, most gaming will actually move into the cloud. So games will be video streamed like movies are streamed on Netflix. And you can play games on any device, basically on your TV at home or on your crappy laptop or your phone or your game console or whatever and and all of these games will look better than than any game that has come before and everything will be processed in the cloud you don't need to buy expensive hardware at home anymore you just play some kind of monthly subscription fee if even that because i think free to play will take over that market eventually as well making it extremely accessible for anyone and um, uh, how much, uh, I mean, the latest uh, startup here, um, uh, Return, um, uh, how, how much can you tell about uh, that one? Well, actually, before I go into Return, um, 
Uh, I would like to say a few words about another company that uh, we incubated here at SISU uh, called Mainframe Industries. As far as I know, it's the first cloud native game development startup in the world. It was started about two years ago uh, by some visionary Icelandic people who are behind the EVE Online MMO. And uh, since we were good friends, they, they brought me into the loop. And eventually we started uh, creating this company together. And during that process, uh, I got uh, you know, very deeply into cloud gaming and started believing into it uh, very sort of intensely. Uh, and I was there involved in a more sort of board level. Uh, and then last year, I decided that I need to be involved with cloud gaming, like personally myself, even more intimately, which is what sort of uh, inspired me to set up the latest company, Return Entertainment. So we are also a cloud native uh, game startup. And uh, we are working on something super cool at the moment, which uh, I, I can't really say much about at this mm. point in public, but uh, when we can finally reveal something probably next year, then then uh, people will see what we are working on. You know, very very exciting stuff, and and um, you know, super thanks for allowing me to be an to be an early investor. So, uh, um, and and uh, you know, I also see a lot of things happening on the you know the tools and middleware uh, side of things. So, done at least one investment that has to do with. With with uh, with cloud gaming on 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 that side, so I, I think uh, I think we will see a lot of interesting things uh, happening. Uh, so so these were the trends, you know. And when you look at an investment, um, you know, you know what, what are the other things you are uh, uh, you looking for? Well, whenever we are investing into into new companies, we always look at the team and the individual members of the team. And one big thing which kind of set us sets us apart from some other investors that we, we want to support people who are or want to become serial entrepreneurs. So what we are really investing in, in are these individuals and their careers in the game industry. Because usually the serial entrepreneurs end up being the most successful ones in this industry. And when we detect that, okay, there's someone up and coming talent that uh, we believe will be here for the long haul and will probably eventually make it big, we will start investing in their first company without hesitation. Because even if that company fails, you know, games come and go, companies come and go, but the individuals, they learn and they stay and they improve and eventually they may skyrocket. So that's sort of a big part of our sort of uh, mantra or thesis. Uh, cool. And um, I, obviously I was speaking about, you know, team here. Um, uh, I, I, I was, of course, you know, happy, uh, you know, that uh, that the team at, at Return uh, started using uh, Favro, um, but quite a lot of the game uh, startups actually uh, do that, so so it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean, just just quickly, you know, what was it that made it that made it stick uh, with the team? Well, basically, um, we uh, reviewed a bunch of different options. Uh, we were using Trello before. Uh, and it was sort of okay for the for the very first uh, phase of, of the company. And then, <clears throat> so then we started developing more different options, including Favro. And uh, and this was before you invested, so there was no bias <laughs> of any kind. And so it was completely objective. And, and uh, we ended up actually just choosing Favro over all the, all the other options because of its. Uh, adaptability and simplicity yet it's super powerful so you can you can sort of mold it to your own needs and, and different kinds of uh, management styles and uh, yeah it's, it's just a very powerful kind of simple looking tool which which uh, is far from being simple in the end uh you know awesome and and just when we talk about you know tools and and middleware in general um i mean i i find that Gaming developers are probably among the most uh, picky um, uh, when it comes to tools. Uh, I don't care so much about brand. They really look at the product. Um, often develop tools themselves, so so it it, it it's a hard crowd to uh, to please. And, and and if you look, you know, generally what you think is important uh, with tools and with middleware for you know, anyone who's listening to this that are in in, in that side of the industry, uh, what is it? What is it that you think is important? Well, accessibility, especially now that we are all working remotely, there needs to be a tool that's 
always online and easy to use and sort of uh, yeah i mean yeah <laughs> it's hard to say um cool um john before we kind of hand over to you do you want to shoot in a, a question as well with uh with uh, somebody are uh, you muted now sorry uh, yeah, thanks, Patrick. And thanks, Samuel. I, I am. That was fascinating. I mean, I've been skeptical about the cloud-based gaming, so um, that you kind of sold me on it just in that five-minute, ten-minute right. walkthrough. So uh, I, I am curious to hear a little bit more um, about how you founded Remedy and how that came came about. So yeah, um, it was me and four other guys, and uh, we had already. In, in our demo scene past, I've uh, been developing some small games and I would say like little demonstrations for even US-based game companies. Uh, we had been uh, talking with even Epic Mega Games, as it was called back then, and, and they were asking us <clears throat> to develop some games, uh, specifically Epic Pinball back in the day. I remember Epic Pinball. But yeah, but the, the demo scene was all about the sort of uh, hippie culture and not not making any money, sort of what the indie game development scene is nowadays. So uh, we respectfully declined all the offers of starting to do commercial productions uh, with, with bigger scale. And uh, but then eventually, when I was uh, graduating from from the uh, business school, I was like, okay, what do you do? What do I actually want to do as as my job? I can't keep working on, on the demo scene. It's not really a job. It's not making me enough money. And, and then I was like, okay, well, game development would be the logical choice. So then I sought out these people who were more sort of uh, thinking about this whole thing as their career, a potential career and more sort of commercial view on it. And I found like-minded people. And, and actually already in the first year, we had 50 people working on different kinds of game prototypes for Remedy. Lots of demo groups were sort of turning themselves into little game studios. So that was, uh, it was pretty crazy, crazy days back, back in 95 and 96. Yeah, that was, that was the dawn of the internet mass market anyway. I mean, I remember shareware and Apogee games and of course, you know, in software, all that was coming out at the same time. So kudos for having that vision to turn that into a real business. Especially being the, yeah. the second, as you say, game studio in your country. Yeah. One thing, by the way, our first game was Death Rally. Second one was, of course, Max Payne. But do you know what Max Payne's original name was? No, I don't. You can't know that. It, it was Dick Justice. <laughs> <laughs> that was a wise choice to change the name. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> And another, you know, impressive thing with that studio is that you, it, it seems like, you know, you kind of also left a, a, a DNA um, in, in the culture um, that have, have, you know, stayed over the years because this is also a studio that, you know, today is still fantastic. I've spent quite a bit of time playing Control and, you know, absolutely amazing game. And, um, you know, with many studios, you know, it doesn't happen that way. You know, they kind of rise to fame and, you know, then kind of die or start making shitty games or get acquired and kind of fizzle. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit rare uh, with, with the studio, which is, you know, getting to, to that success, that quality, and, and then are able to, to, you know, keep going also after, you know, founders like, like you have left uh, to, to do other things. So, uh, yeah, you, you def there was something there that, some DNA that was created that, that has been uh, um uh, that's, that's been very successful um do you, do you what's what, what what do you think that is well i can't take credit on on any of the uh developments since since i departed ways in in 2000 but but yeah i mean it was a very unique bunch of people who, who were very ambitious about what they wanted to do and, and super talented we had the the fortune of of getting some of the geniuses to join us early on and, and they stayed there for a long time. So yeah, it was unique uh, circumstances with unique uh, ingredients, so to speak, which sort of brought us to this day. 
And uh, speaking about kind of, you know, ways of working, I think this is a good segue over to you, John. Um, the, um, I mean, today uh, there are um, many studios, or I guess most that you know, need to transition to, to remote work, but, but there also are studios. That I know we have a couple of clients that were basically formed on that principle that were remote first already from, from, from day one. And obviously <laughs> that's a pretty good choice, you know, today. Um, so, so with that said, um, you know, super thanks, uh, Samari, and and uh, and over to you, John. Yeah, I echo that. Thank you, thank you, uh, Samuel. I. It was really kind of a an honor to meet you, at least online. Um, I mean, when I I would come from the video game industry myself, and um, at my heart, you know, I'm still somewhat of a fanboy. So again, pleasure to meet you, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank today. you for having me. Thank you. Uh, so great. Well, now we're just going to transition a little bit into the core topic of today, which is remote, the remote game studio and how have studios, uh, specifically Fabro customers, made that transition into remote and made that transition successfully. So I'm going to share my screen again here, get back to Fabro. Okay, and now we're gonna transition down to what we're looking at here are Favreau boards. And one of the things you're gonna notice right away in this tool, and this is one of the reasons why we're presenting out of the tool today, is that you have the ability to have multiple boards, not just a single board, um, as you see here, in a collection. So here we have a section where, again, all of these are clickable. If you want more information on Samulai, you can click here, here's his LinkedIn, um, all, a lot of information on all of these cards that are, of course, clickable. You can go in and find out all the things that I'm talking about today. Um, another good example of this, and I just want to, before I get into the core of things, is this producer dashboard, where you can see it's not just multiple uh, boards in multiple different views. You know, here we have a Kanban board. Here we have a, a uh, you know, obviously a timeline view, and here we have a sheets view. So you can transition the board on the fly. It's the same cards, it's just displayed differently. But you also can have multiple backlogs. So if I'm a producer and I have a team, multiple teams maybe working on a multiple feature backlogs originated from a master backlog, um, multiple art asset backlogs, maybe an internal art asset backlog and an external art asset backlog like this, both the backlogs and the boards can interact with one another because the, the cards, the Fabro cards can exist in multiple places at the same time. Lots of unique features in Fabro that make it highly flexible and it's probably one of the reasons why uh, Samulai is, is a fan and his new, one of his new studios are also fans because of the flexibility as he said. It's simple to pick up like a good game. It's simple to start using but it's difficult to master because there is so much flexibility, so much depth hidden behind the simplicity. So the remote game studio, I mean, a lot of you are living it. Thanks again for everybody who joined today, who was with us today. There, um, you know, it's been a challenge. I mean, I work directly with a lot of game studios right now as an agile coach, and it's been a challenge, but the game industry is very resilient, very adaptable by nature and especially game studios that have kind of had an agile mindset to begin with have made the transition much simpler, especially game studios like Riot Games, for example, very large Favro customer that has been using Favro for years. And so to, to make that switch to remote work was probably quite a bit easier than it would have been if they had to adapt on the fly. So to get us started, just a little bit of inspiration. Um, when the pandemic hit, you know, fa Patrick and I started talking and we said, you know, everybody's working remotely now. Everybody's going to make this move to remote studios. We're locking down. A lot of my trips were canceled to go visit game studios uh, on site. And so, you know, we thought, let's, let's start this remote game studio webinar series. We'll invite people like Sam Eli, who is with us today, to talk about their experiences with this move to remote. And uh, another, you know, inspirational quote from Martin Miko, CEO of HackerOne. He's also a Favreau investor, by the way. Um, 
he wrote this open letter to the world essentially and said this, the industrial revolution brought us the idea that work is a place different from home and that work is done in physical proximity of many other people. It is that the idea of the joint workplace that is the anomaly. Working from home is natural. And I mean, of course, working from home is natural. There are interruptions at home, but not like interruptions that you have in a co-located office, right? There, there are obviously benefits to being co-located, but a lot of those benefits are overwhelmed by the fact, and you can see this in the second inspirational quote, that offices have become interruption factories. Game studios have become interruption factories. I remember when I was back at Electronic Arts working on The Sims, and we were in an open plan office, and everybody thought open plan offices were gonna be a great way for teams to collaborate, especially agile teams. And it, it's turned out to just not be the case, right? There's tons of interruptions. It's very hard to concentrate on getting actual real work done, especially for software engineers, artists, and individual contributors. Um, it's very difficult to actually do focused work. And to do focused work, as it says here, you know, you have to have uninterrupted time. And working remotely gives you that especially if you're working remotely the right way and you don't have a plethora of meetings that you have to get through on Zoom, whatever the case may be. And that's part of what we're gonna talk about today, how to resolve those challenges. So first to the benefits, you know, one of the very obvious benefits is, and studios are really, not just game studios, other biz, Twitter, you know, big, large Silicon Valley based campus type businesses are realizing they don't need those campuses anymore. They don't need those mega offices offices anymore um, and they can save so much money not just stuff on the office space but everything that's involved with having a physical co-located space the staff involved the security um, maybe there's going there's obviously less travel between those offices um, this 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 move to remote which in a lot of ways according to the guys who wrote the that last quote um, is inevitable now, this move to remote with technology and tools like Zoom and Favro and Slack has been inevitable. It's, it's so much easier to work remotely now than it, it has ever been. And by far and large, the benefits of working remotely far outweigh the negatives or the challenges, which we're going to get to in a second. So um, a nice article here. You'll be able to open up this card and click it on how to run your entire game studio in a single tool, tool in Favro. And the point being is that Favro can be essentially your, your remote office, your virtual workspace where everybody comes together as team, teams of teams to build, to build extraordinary things, to build these extraordinary, extraordinary games that everybody online and people watching the recording are doing on a daily basis. A side benefit has been that you're able to recruit and keep the best talent regardless of location. As you can see here, and this it's in, on the cards, these Favreau cards, they're kind of like live Google Docs. Uh, you can collaborate in real time. And we're just showing the example of a, of a table here where you know, we're showing that you don't have to really worry about physical geographic location anymore. You don't have to pay relocation costs. You don't have to find somebody who's willing to relocate to LA or willing to relocate to uh, the Bay Area or some expensive city um, that they, they may not choose to live in, right? So now people are finding that they can live anywhere and still contribute to a larger team and teams of teams in a game studio environment. Another very nice side benefit and something that um, we've been a proponent of for a long time is diversity, right? So as Samuel I said, with the rise of mobile phones and mobile gaming, you know, I love this, his statistic here about 2.5 to 3 billion people playing on phones. It's absolutely true. And it's not the core gamers anymore that make up the, the largest part of the business. As he said, only 10% of, of the industry is console business. Of course, a very important part of the business. And I'm a core gamer, big fan of co core games. But the point being is that products, these games are being made for the entire world. Different ethnic backgrounds, you know, different races, different genders, you know, different, what you name it. So diversity is key, right? And to have 
members of your team, diverse members of your team is also key because you're going to be building products that are much more likely to relate and resonate with that larger world audience, as it were. And so just a quick example here um, in Favro, and this is trying to get across the point, these are all what are called Favro collections, kind of set up as Slack channels and this UI UX. And you can see here that while we do have art teams, internal and external, and we have producer dashboards and live ops, a mobile app team, some feature teams, um, the point being with Favro is that it's supposed to be run your entire studio, run your entire business, as it were, in the tool, including things like HR, you know, uh, IP, uh, licensing, whatever other ancillary things you have to run as a game studio, you can all run it all in Favro. And of course, the more you can minimize your tool stack, the better. Create that single source of truth. And that single source of truth could be a tool like Favro. And you can see here, we set up a recruitment Kanban, just pulling, um, in this case, Patrick, through your recruitment pipeline. And it would just be like an art asset pipeline or a recruitment Kanban, right? It's getting things done from start to finish. In this case, finding all those resumes, filtering it down to who do we actually want to call? Who do we want to interview? You know, get those people down to who do we want to do the reference checks for all the way through to hired. So back to this presentation collection. And another big key benefit is happier teams. And, you know, I've been quoting in past um, webinars it was like 54% in the last poll server that I saw uh, of people that would at least like to have the option to work remotely, if not the majority of the time, at least some of the time, right? But the last poll that I saw, which was an independent poll, and this is after two, three, four months of, of people working remotely, um, that number is now up into the 70, almost 80 percentile of people who would love to have the flexibility to continue to work remotely. And it's just because simply, even with the challenge of having, if you have kids and they're working at home, those are interruptions that for a large part you can control, unlike being in a co-located office, especially an open plan office where they're out of your control. You cannot control those interruptions, not to mention the better work-life balance, right? Hopefully you can get online, do your work, get offline at a regular time, and then there is no commute. You know, there's no, uh, not only are there no interruptions, you don't have to do that drive back and forth. In some cases, like in LA or in the Bay Area, you might be driving up over an hour each way, which is insanity, right? And we're gonna get to that in a second. But, an, an, you know, it's just been proven time and time again, and me as an agile coach, happy individuals make happier teams, and the happier t your teams are, that's just gonna lead to increased creativity and productivity. And I've got an example here again in Favro of this whole concept of Kazen, continuous improvement, change for the better. And again, using the tool to run your team retrospectives, um, to create a Kazen backlog, which all the action items that come out of, or improvement items that come out of those respect retrospectives, feeding into this continuous improvement or Kazen backlog, and then moving these improvement items on a priority-based basis to a Kazen board, just as you would to a scrum board or a combine board to actually get product work done, game mechanics work done, or art asset work done. Take your improvement, team improvement and happiness items as seriously as you do getting the actual work done. And overall, it just becomes this magical thing where you know, the happier your teams are again, the more productive those teams are. Just an interesting statistic here on the no commuting factor. So in the US at least, the average is, is between 304 hours per year per commuter. So with remote work, that's, that's gone, that's gone out the window. You don't have to worry about commuting anymore. And that, that is a big contributor again to the overall happiness factor. You get all of that time back. So those are the benefits. There's of course more benefits, but we'll get to some of the challenges. And again, as, a, as an agile coach, I see these challenges on a daily basis. And one of them is the fear of losing that studio culture, that 
what makes us unique as a studio. And one of the first things I realized is that with studios moving to remote work, the, 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 both the strengths and the weaknesses have been vastly amplified to the point where if you had a weak studio culture, maybe a very command and control hierarchical culture, um, not a lot of trust, not a lot of accountability, that's just, that may have worked for you when you were co-located, but it's just not gonna work in the move to remote for obvious reasons. So if you were an agile type of, or, or, an, or more agile minded studio with a lot of trust, a lot of accountability, a lot of transparency to begin with, that move to remote has been much easier. And those strengths have also been amplified. So both the weak weaknesses and the strengths have, strengths have been amplified in this move to remote. So if you didn't have a strong trust and accountability studio culture to begin with, now it's, you know, it's been proven that you need to have it. And you have to have this remote first, hopefully an agile remote first, studio culture and studio mindset. And one of the things we've done to help with that is we've created this Fabro Remote Work Playbook. You do, again, you can just click on this link um, to maintain some uh, some ideas are in there. But another idea, we wrote another article, uh, Fabro After Work Gaming. Um, even though I am a consultant to Fabro, they still invite me to play, you know, Call of Duty Warzone with them every Friday, which you know, I love doing. And it maintains that kind of cohesive studio culture. And that, in this case, the Fabro business culture. Um, well, one I hear all the time, you know, are people working? And this was a big fear, especially in the beginning, beginning of the move to remote. And I think that's one of the big reasons for so many meetings, right? Um, which is another one that I hear all the time. And there's also been this, how do we track people? You know, how do we make sure people are working? And in my mind, that's a that's a key sign of a, of a weak studio culture in the first place, right? It, it should have always been about keeping the eyes on the baton, not the runners, meaning keeping the eye on the flow of value instead of the individual contributors, you know, the team members. So keeping an eye on how fast are we creating art assets? How fast, you know, what are the cycle times and lead times from idea creation to actually releasing it to our player base? Right. So keep your eyes on the baton because it's that baton getting around the track four times in a relay race that wins the race, not the runners, individual runners themselves. Of course, they're contributing, but just imagine at the end of the race, you know, or after that first runner had finished his, his lap, you said, OK, now you got to go not run another relay race. Right. It just it just you wouldn't win that race. So the idea is, is that in any system, there's got to be a little bit of slack. There's got to be that trust and accountability, but focus more on the flow of value, your, your gameplay mechanics, you know, um, your features being released to your player base, the art asset content drops, whatever it is, instead of making sure people are working, you know, making sure people are busy. So by tracking that flow of value, which you can do in a tool like Fabo very easily, that's going to inherently ensure that people are working as a side effect rather is the main focus. So a quick example of this, again, in the tool, maybe you have a, a small game app team and they're working just in this uh, scrum-based way. And you can see here when I move the cards from column to column, we get this time and column statistic automatically and we get this time on board statistic automatically. So we can see, for example, that the stats tracking has been in test for 13 days. And you know that might be a problem, but at least you're gonna see that that's a problem because again, you're, you're not tracking your individuals, you're tracking the flow of value, you're tracking those features, you're tracking those assets and how long have they been you know, in production, in development um, as a whole and how long have they even been in each particular stage? And Favreau tracks all of that for you. Also built into each board, our burn down charts, cumulative flow diagrams, which are excellent way of, of tracking the flow of value over time. There's even control charts. Um, another way, if you're working in a combine flow based way to track your average lead times, your average cycle times. Um, it's another great way to see, are we improving as a team? 
as far as flow of value goes, or are we actually, you know, staying the same or maybe even getting worse? So easy ways built into the tool just by working as you maybe normally would to track that flow. Too many meetings. And you know, th this has been a resounding thing that continues to happen with the teams that I work with. Too many meetings and really as um, you know, Bonfire Studios put it so well, too many meetings are the symptom. It's not the real problem, right? So the real problem is that there's confusion on what to do next. There's a, there's a lack of clear direction and goals. There's this whole concept and Riot Games is great at this of, of outcome driven development. So concentrating more on you know, what outcome are we trying to achieve versus how many outputs do we do? Those outputs being features and assets. They're focused more on what it is, what impact do we want to have with our player base and what change behavior do we want to see from an outcome standpoint? So again, you know, making that clear, what those expected outcomes, goals, impacts are, uh, is, is a, a, a clear cut way to instantly reduce the number of meetings because trust your teams to take those clear goals, those clear initiatives, and make it happen. Um, another reason is they can't see what's going on. They can't see what their team is working on. They can't see what other teams are working on that they have to collaborate with. Um, a tool like Favro lets you visualize your work in progress. You can see what the team's working on. You can see what, where if something's stuck. You can see what you need to do that day. You can see, you know, if you have to collaborate with another team, you can see where they're at and share work back and forth with them in a very clear visual way. And another key thing here, and, and what I think contributes to too many meetings, too much time on Zoom, especially these ad hoc meetings, is there's no way to communicate where the work is, where the work is flowing. You know, teams are using Slack, everybody's using Slack, everybody's using Zoom, um, and Slack is great, don't get me wrong. You know, I use Slack on a daily basis, Fabric uses Slack, but for, the actual getting the work done conversations where the decisions are made, where the bottlenecks are, where the impediments are, where the blocks are, all of that communication should be taking place where the work is being done. And so you can communicate directly in favor, and I'm gonna show you how that happens in a minute. Um, so have those conversations, instead of in Slack, where it's very hard to find and put it in context to the actual work, have those conversations in a tool like Favreau. Okay, and finally, collaboration and innovation. Everybody's worried, are we gonna lose the ability to innovate if we're not co-located? Are we gonna lose the ability to obviously collaborate if we're not co-located? And it's just, you know, the answer to that, especially if you have the right tool set, is, is absolutely not a problem. I have another example here um, to illustrate this point. Say you're a feature team and you're working in a collection that looks like this. And you have, your backlog, so it's very clear what you should be working on next, maybe stack rank prioritized or using tags to prioritize however you want to do it. And that's feeding a, a team sprint board. You even have a feature roadmap up here at the top. Um, and you get to a point where you realize you have embedded QA on the team and that embedded QA person realizes, okay, I don't, I'm blocked. Um, I can't continue, I can't test this properly. I don't have, you know, take cover behind objects. I don't have the block model that I need or the multiple block models that I need to test this feature, see if it actually works as intended um, or meets, you know, again, that expected outcome. So the idea is here is again, have that conversation where the work is happening, right? You can make it very clear that something's blocked. Um, you can even create a block column and use automatic tagging and automatic assignment to automatically tag this as blocked and automatically assign it to maybe the team lead or if you're working in pure scrum way, the scrum master, the person responsible for removing that impediment. And so that person could then add in maybe a board from another team who could remove that block. They don't actually have to have the, the board. They could transfer this card or add this card to their pipeline um, without seeing the board, but just to illustrate the point. You can take they could then take this blocked item that is blocked by an art asset 
and drag and drop it to the beginning stage of this internal art asset teams Kanban or, or art asset pipeline. And as you can see here, the card exists in multiple places. It exists in the backlog. It also exists here in this feature team scrum board. And now it is, exists in a third place in this internal art asset teams Kanban. And so they're seeing this live and real time in their own collection here, right? So they just saw, oh, wow, the same board, same backlog. They're saying, okay, this feature is now blocked by an art asset. They're gonna open that up. They're gonna see what it is that's needed. They're gonna see the conversation and they're gonna start working on this hopefully expedited if you're doing feature driven development to get this all the way to done or at least the block model definition of done as quickly as possible. So then this team, the feature team will see that that's been completed and they will be able to move this maybe back to test to continue working on it over here. All right, so some of the big picture solutions to these challenges. Okay, let's first address the studio culture. Now I can kind of break this down into two main solutions, the, the, the actually three, the three things you need to focus on to successfully make the most remote. Or if you're struggling with it, you know, improve that overall studio culture, improve your, your processes, improve your tooling. Okay, so you can break it down into people or culture, process and tools. So to start with people and culture, again, you've got to establish that studio-wide trust and accountability. And from a leadership standpoint, if you're a producer, you know, if you're a director, development director, if you're studio leads, if you're studio management, you, you've got to move to more of a, a, a servant leadership mindset. That's an agile term. It just means leaders in any org organization, whether it's a game studio, whatever type of business it is, should be focused on giving those clear goals, like clear expected outcomes, um, expected impacts, giving clear direction, and then essentially getting out of the way. You're not there to assign work. You're not there to tell people what to do and how to do it. You're there to provide the intent. And if somebody's blocked, of course, try to clear the way, provide that architectural framework or that workspace or that work environment at home that's going to allow those teams, the people you hired to do what their specialties are as well as possible. And for the individual contributors, you have to have a mindset change too. There's no studio to show up to anymore. So how do you know, how do people know you're working? And they know you're working by adding value. And your mindset change as an individual contributor has to be more of um, an entrepreneur, a business owner, like Samuel I, instead of an employee. So I made that mindset change myself when I decided to start my own business um, agile consultancy. Now it's a big mindset change from being an employee and waiting to be given work as opposed to actively looking for work or ways to improve things or ways to improve the process, improve the flow, uh, coming up with better ideas, adding that consistent value to your teams and to the studio as a whole. That's how you show up in a remote workplace. And last but not least, Another strong agile concept, pillar of agile, really transparency and visibility. It's never been important, more important to have transparent, transparency and visibility from the top level of the studio business initiatives to the individual IPs and games to the team levels and teams of teams. That transparency and visibility is so important. So people are aligned. People know what they should be working on. People know what the overall goals are. And to kind of illustrate that, I have an example of a, what's called a studio backlog in Favro. Again, another great example of how game studios will use Favro not just to drive development at the team level, but even drive it at the, the top, what's called the portfolio level of the studio, where you can see all of in a backlog, you can use the hierarchical nature of a Favro backlog to have all of your development projects that are currently in development, 
um, new IP initiatives, new technology initiatives, things you might need to do from a facilities perspective, um, maybe with the move to remote, you know, like uh, give them a budget for the remote workspaces, maybe downsize your physical office space, uh, the recruiting initiatives that to happen, have to happen. And then literally taking these and dragging and dropping these to commit these to what's called a studio portfolio roadmap. And from here, I can then say, okay, well, let's actually target this for Q3. And since those cards can exist in multiple places, I'm gonna minimize this for a second and look at this studio portfolio Kanban. I'm gonna take that same initiative and replicate it here. So we can see that it's targeted for Q3 and it's originated from the studio portfolio Kanban. You can also see that thanks to relations here in the backlog. When this moves from selected to review and analysis, you can see that status change here in the backlog too, again, because the card exists in multiple places. So really driving, you know, cre creating a dashboard like this that's maybe visible to the entire studio um, so that they can see what's going on, what are we doing as a business, what are we doing as an entire studio, and then pulling in other boards and backlogs if you are studio leadership to be able to see big picture, maybe release plans um, of other games in process, in progress like this, uh, see those recruitment pipelines, bringing in other backlogs, whatever the case may be, building in, building your own studio dashboard and the tool to get a big picture view of how the studio is doing and what's going on. Okay, so there's never been a better time if you haven't already adopted an agile mindset, if you aren't using agile ways of working, there's, there's never been a better time to do it than now, almost a necessary time. Um, you know, teams, when I was working as a producer, uh, you know, even back in 2003, at Microsoft Game Studios, it was called at the time, instead of Xbox Game Studios, it was about, you know, there was team level agility or teams are starting to experiment with scrum and Kanban, different ways of working, um, adopting this more of an agile, adapting to change type way of working. But for most studios, uh, even the studios that I continue to work with, it never really made that whole agility never really made it past the team level. You know, it never really made it to teams of teams or the product level, the, the individual game level, and it's certainly not to the entire studio working in agile ways with you know, recruiting, working in agile ways with uh, licensing, whatever the case may be. The other aspects of the studio, outsourcing, localization, everything needs to be agile, everything needs to be flowing. And you want it to be flowing and aligned in a very organic, natural way, which again, a tool like Power provides. The second thing from a process standpoint is creating this studio cadence. So team level cadence, whether it's every two weeks, you're doing the inspect and adapt, the planning, the review, the retrospectives, but then the overall teams of teams for each individual game. And then of course, the overall studio cadence, whether the entire studio meets online or once things clear, you have these on sites, as Favreau is calling them, as opposed to off site meetings, where you bring the entire studio together um, on a regular basis, a predictable basis, whether it's once every quarter, whether it's twice a year, whatever the case may be, to keep teams aligned and in sync at all levels of the studio. Again, focus on studio flow of value and focus on self-managed teams, self-managed accountable teams to, to make sure that that value is flowing from start to finish as quickly as possible. And a tool like Favreau lets you do that both at the studio level and the team level. And this is all this other concept of value-based metrics, which you can also track in a tool like Favro. Last but not least here, under solutions, uh, your tooling. And again, you wanna minimize your tool stack as much as possible, right? And so everybody's using Zoom, we're using Zoom right now for this webinar. A lot of studios are using Slack great tools, you know, Slack is awesome for asynchronous general discussion, ad hoc conversations, but it's difficult to find things specific to the work. You wanna see how a decision was made to do this feature instead of this feature. 
you know, it, it can be very difficult to backtrack and see what channel is that, that in. Whereas in a tool like Favro, not only is it great for the planning and collaboration, but it's also an, an amazing place to have those conversations and have those conversations so that they're easy to find by other people maybe in the future. One last example here of an art dashboard. And here you might have an art director who's working with both um, internal and external teams, maybe some outsourcing. They are tracking at multiple levels. So in the backlog, you can see they have uh, maybe some content drops. They've got a character content drop, a weapons content drop. External teams are working on a cars content drop and environment props content drop. And so you can track here at a high level. So I could take this card out of the backlog and commit it here to this art release deliverables. So I'm tracking at a high level. So I can see that that content drop is currently in progress. But I can also track at the individual art asset level. So I can see, well, this particular one's currently in illustration. This one's in sketch. This one's also in illustration as something moves to model and texture, you can see that instantly here in the backlog. If I were to take a new one and say, okay, this is the next high, highest priority thing that we need to work on, this Bowie knife, drag it on to this art asset pipeline or Kanban. Again, we can see that flow directly from the backlog. But we can also be managing in the same collection, we don't have to drop, jump back and forth between different screens to do this, our external team. So we have an external outsourcing team and maybe we've got a new art asset here. Create some hierarchy. And we're gonna commit that to external artist one, whoever that might happen to be on his board here. And we can see, okay, this is currently at the concept stage of the external art team. And as that changes, as that team, that external team who can be using guest licenses in Favreau, which are free, you're gonna be able to track that all from the backlog and see where each and every single one of those individual art assets currently is at. Again, directly from the backlog, but you can also open up the board to see uh, you know, very detailed information on where those things sit. You can again, even turn on your flow-based metrics like time on board and time on column and see where things are stuck or why things are delayed. Okay, um, so that is, we're getting very close to the end here, but I do wanna call out that prior to the lockdown, uh, Favro um, gave me this very cool project, which was to travel around to a number of their customers, uh, including, as you can see here, Wizards of the Coast, um, a number of other game studios on, on the West Coast and throughout the world, uh, to interview some Favreau users who also happen to be some of the best uh, producers, game producers in the world. And so all of those success stories are available at learn.favreau.com, customer stories, where you can see all of these interviews. And last but not least, the partnership between Favre and Broadcove Insights. Um, we found that people wanted to quickly get up and running with Favreau. Um, they, they didn't want to, to kind of figure it out themselves and go through the pain of how do we scale this thing? How do we train it? You know, how do we do the integrations? How do we do the data migrations from other tools? So instead of trying to figure it out how to do it themselves, um, using our expertise, expertise and working again in partnership directly with Favro, we can make that happen. It's been proven in three days. There's also a five-day version for larger studios, um, but the three-day version seems to work. And all the details are here. Here's everything that's included. Um, another nice benefit is Favro is agreeing to give a 25% annual discount for anybody who opts to go with the quick start. Uh, we will sit down with you and figure out how should your studio be structured in Favro and the Favro organization. 
from a collection standpoint, from a group standpoint, the dashboards, even down to the workflows before any of the work begins of putting it into the tool. So you're starting off in a good place, in the optimal place. Um, we'll also create the integrations for you. Uh, Favro comes with pre-built native integrations to Slack, Jira, GitHub, G Suite, et cetera. So you can still use the studio critical applications that you're already using in conjunction with Favro. There's no extra cost for any of these integrations. And then of course, we'll help you with migrations to existing tools. Now, one of the big benefits is the training is included. So this Favro certified Favro platform master, I just certified um, some people yesterday uh, and continue to certify people. It's a great head start to, inter to train your internal champions. The people who are really going to take Favro and run with it and train other people in the studio on how to use the tool and how to get the maximum amount of value and leverage out of the tool. That's also included in this three day quick start. Here's a view of the timeline. So we start with the design, figuring out how we're gonna structure Favreau in your studio, uh, do the integrations and migrations on day one. There's a communications plan that we provide to communicate with everybody in the studio remotely about what's going on, how things are progressing, uh, tips and tricks before the tool is even launched. The, the training is done on day two that Favreau platform master training for up to nine people in your studio. They get those certifications as well, the digital badge to display wherever they want. There's some individual contributor onboarding on day three, and that's when the launch happens. And then there's success tracking built into the tool, which we help you, we help you read and maintain and configure um, to see are people using the tool remotely? Are people using the tool the way it was intended? to be used and and that can help with further training these people who are now certified Favro platform masters can focus on those areas to make sure people are getting the most out of the tool okay um so i am going to stop the share and see if yeah so we are good um looks like there are no questions but thank you again everybody for joining and i am going to wrap this up if anybody does have questions after the fact you're going to be getting a follow-up email including the collection that we were presenting out of today so feel free to send me those questions and i will add those questions to this board here and you'll be able to see those questions in line when you get this shared collection. So again, thank you very much for joining. And we look forward, we're, having, we're going to continue to do these webinars throughout the fall, and we're going to continue to have special guests. Thanks for our special guests today for joining us, and we hope to see you at future, future events. Thanks very much, bye-bye.